welcome along strange historians this is the strange history podcast i am hopefully your favorite strange historian this time around we're going to talk about what happened at the home of lizzie borden so sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of mead or a chalice of cider or a flagon filled with any beverage of your choice and join your fellow strange historians around the campfire. Imagine, today is Thursday, August 4th, 1892. The sun has risen, and we are standing in the dining room of the home of Andrew Borden and his family. Andrew, Abby, and Lizzie are seated at the table. Their maid Bridget is also here. They don't look too good. That's because on Tuesday they had swordfish, which may have gotten them all sick. Or maybe it was the pork steaks that they had for breakfast on Wednesday. Or maybe it was both. Or maybe, just maybe, someone has been trying to poison one of them. Or all of them. Yesterday, Abby went across the street to tell their neighbor, Dr. Seabury Bowen, that she feared the family was being poisoned. Mr. Andrew Borden did not like that neighbor and did not want to receive a bill from him. So he called out and he told his wife to come straight home. You turn and you see Uncle John entering the dining room. He is the only one who's not sick. For breakfast, they all have cold mutton and mutton broth and coffee cake and bananas. During the entire meal, no one speaks much. After breakfast, Andrew and Uncle John walked to the sitting room where they chat about business matters. Meanwhile, Abby instructs Bridget to wash all the windows in the house, inside and out. Bridget does not feel well, and it's a hot August day. And this is the last thing she feels like doing, but she agrees. At around 8.48 a.m., Uncle John leaves to run errands and to visit his niece. He planned to return to the Borden home for a midday meal. About 12 minutes later, Andrew Borden also left the house. He walked out the front door. It is not known whether or not he locked the door. He likely expected someone to lock it behind him. But the ladies were all very busy and it does not seem like anyone did. Abby Borden remains downstairs and prepares to organize her day. As Bridget walks out the door, she sees Miss Borden dusting. Bridget was nauseous, and when she gets outside, she vomits in the backyard. And when she composes herself, she goes down to the cellar to gather her cleaning supplies and a pail of water. Lizzie's in the kitchen. She sets up her ironing board on the dining room table to iron handkerchiefs. Mrs. Borden tells Lizzie that she is going to go upstairs to straighten out the guest room. Meanwhile, Andrew Borden is off on his morning walk. He plans to make a visit to the bank, go over to a construction site, and engage in some other errands. He no doubt passed a few people who did not like him, including tenants who were late on the rent that they owed him. He also may have passed an illegitimate son who was angry at him and also angry at his wife, Abby Borden. After all, she is married to the man who he might feel his mother should be married to. Andrew Borden does not look well. He tells people he plans to return home to take a nap. A lot of people hear this, including, perhaps, 
his illegitimate son or a good friend of his illegitimate son who's really angry at Andrew Borden. Some time passes and it is now between 10 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And it is at this time that Abby Borden is in the guest room. And she's dusting the inside of the windowsills and she is not aware that someone has entered the room behind her. She then backs away and begins to dust the furniture in the corner of the room next to the bed. It is then when she hears someone and she turns slowly and her eyes open wide and she doesn't know what to think at first but then she realizes that she's in danger. Worse, her husband and others she cares about will also be in danger. She then wonders for a split second if she or anyone else remembered to lock the front door after her husband left for this morning's walk because clearly someone got in. And so she opens her mouth but no words can come out. She doesn't know what to say. She is horrified. She doesn't even put up her hands to defend herself as the edge of a hatchet strikes on the side of her face. It creates a four inch long wound beginning at the lower border of the left nasal bone and reaches down to the lower edge of the lower jaw, cutting through her nose, upper lip, lower lip, and slightly into the bone of her upper and lower jaw. She is repeatedly struck in the face until she falls to the floor, and at that point, the assailant begins to repeatedly bring the hatchet down into Abby's skull over and over again with brutal force. One, One two, two, three, three four, four, five, five six, six, seven, eight, eight. <laughs> the forceful blows broke through the back of her skull. There was extensive damage to her brain. She also suffered a deep gash in her back. Her face was oh, terribly bruised from both the fall and the force of being repeatedly struck on the back of her head. Oh, that's a lot of effort. A lot of strength. It's hot in here. It's exhausting. There's blood spatter everywhere and blood is pouring out of Abby's head. This place is a mess. The murderer no doubt has blood on their face and in their hair and on their clothes. And what's more, it's a hot August day. The window to the left 
It's letting in the morning sun, heating up the room even more. So the murderer is not only covered with blood, but also sweat. Not just the sweat on their face and body, but sweat that has sweeped onto their blood-covered clothes. The murderer's heart is racing. The murderer's arm hurts. Hitting anything. 19 times with a hatchet. It's quite a physical effort. Gotta be in really good shape to do that. And so the murderer stays put doesn't move and thinks about what to do next. At this point, the murderer hears a door open. Lizzie has entered her bedroom. And a few minutes later, the murderer hears someone knocking on the front door downstairs. And so Lizzie comes out of her bedroom and descends the stairs. And when she hears Bridget curse in Irish, it kind of makes her laugh, as it always does. And you hear Mr. Borden enter the house. And he tells Bridget and Lizzie that he doesn't feel well and he came home to take a nap. And so the murderer stays in that room. Does it make a sound? And so we descend the stairs and we see Lizzie encouraging her father to take a nap on the sofa since he seems uneasy and might not make it up the stairs to his bedroom. And so Lizzie folds up his coat so that he can use it as a pillow. And she asks him if he would like the blinds to be opened or closed. And Andrew Borden puts his feet up on the sofa and Lizzie usually helps her father take his boots off but this time, well, the thing is, she's not feeling well herself. She's kind of nauseous. She's as sick as everybody else, and she's just not thinking straight. And so she notices that Bridget looks sick. And Bridget is very hot from washing the windows. And so Lizzie figures maybe Bridget could use a break and get some fresh air. And so Lizzie tells Bridget about a sale at the Frank E. Sargent Company. And you see, they're having a sale on cotton dress goods. And so she suggests that she might want to go and check it out. And Bridget really likes the idea, but because she's not feeling well herself, she tells Lizzie that, well, she's just gonna go take a nap in her bedroom, which is located on the third floor of the house. And Lizzie agrees, and so she leaves her father in the parlor, and she puts on a straw hat, and then she exits through the back door, and she goes to the barn behind the house. You see, she's got a fishing trip coming up, and she needs to get some lead sinkers. And along the way, she pulls some pears off the back pear tree. While Bridget is sleeping on the third floor, and Lizzie is out of the house and in the back barn, the murderer descends the stairs at the front of the house. Slowly. Quietly. Carefully, the murderer reaches the bottom of the stairs and is now standing in the entry hall. There are choices to be made here. Walk out the front door or try to make it out the back door. Or finish what was started. And so the murderer walks very slowly into the sitting room and sees Andrew Borden, the target, the real target of all the hatred, of all the venom. Andrew Borden is sleeping on the sofa. And so the murderer looks around to make sure no one is there to stop this. The coast is is clear. And so the murderer lifts up the hatchet with an already aching arm and wipes the sweat 
from their face and then brings the hatchet down upon Andrew Borden's face, splitting his eye. Over and over again, the hatchet comes down, splitting Andrew's lips, splitting his lower jawbone, splitting his nose. And another blow strikes the side of Andrew's head, splitting his skull, leaving a deep gash in his brain. And blood spatter is everywhere, even more than that from upstairs around Abby. Blood is pouring down the sofa and onto the floor. The murderer now has even more blood on their face and in their hair and on their clothes. The murderer is drenched with sweat. The murderer's arms and shoulders feel like they're gonna fall off. They are burning in pain. And so the murderer backs up, looks around, think. Now what? Go out the front door? <laughs> no way. Too risky. Go out the back door? There's a chance of running into Lizzie. Ah, but the murderer's got an axe. Alrighty, well, if anybody's in the way, then the murderer will just have to deal with that. There is no other choice. And so the murderer walks into the kitchen and looks out the back window. No sign of Lizzie. That's because she's in the barn. And so the murderer turns and looks out the back door window. No sign of anyone. And so the murderer slowly opens the door, slowly steps outside turns right and quickly walks into the cellar just to have a quick place to collect himself and so once inside there's this opportunity to recover a bit oh look there's running water there's a sink there's even a chance to get cleaned up just a little bit and if the murderer has a bag in preparation for this then there's even a chance to change their clothes. And so after 10 minutes or so, the murderer looks out the back door and sees Lizzie walking into the house. This is the one and only chance to escape. And so the murderer does and walks away from the back of the Borden house, passing other buildings, and along the way, possibly, throws the axe on the roof of a barn, or maybe not, and keeps on going further and further away from the home of Lizzie Borden and her family, two of whom the murderer just killed. Lizzie enters the house to the back door and enters the kitchen. She goes to check on her irons to see if they are hot. She then walks into the dining room to put down her hat. And then she walks into the sitting room to check on her father. And once she does, her life changes forever. She sees her father. The man who she thought was kind and generous and wonderful. Her father, the man who raised her, and her sister, her strong father, the man who always protected her, who always took care of her, who she loved, who she always loved. She sees that he cannot be there for her ever again. 
She sees that his face is gone. It's been all chopped up. Her father is gone. Lizzie then realizes that she's standing exactly where the killer was standing and her mind is in a haze. Is she now in danger? Is her stepmother in danger? No, 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 no. She thinks she remembers her stepmother saying she was going to go out to see a sick friend or... Well, maybe she didn't. I, it's hard to know. A million thoughts are racing through her head. Uh, Bridget! Is, is Bridget in danger? Maybe the murderer is still in the house. And so Lizzie quickly walks through the kitchen into the hallway and opens the door to the back stairs and she screams out, Bridget! Come down quick! Someone has hurt father! Now Bridget hears Lizzie screaming out to her. And so she jumps out of bed and she hightails it down the flights of steps from the attic. And her heart is racing. Whew, she's out of breath. And she's confused. And she's terrified. And Lizzie tells her, don't go in there. Please go get a doctor, quickly. And so Bridget turns and she leaves out the back door and she runs to Dr. Bowen. But, but he's not home. And so, strangely, he's at the home of where Uncle John just was. Because, in a strange coincidence, someone is sick in that house too. Wherever Uncle John seems to go that morning, people get sick. And so Bridget turns and she leaves the house again to go do that. And Lizzie as you can imagine, is in a daze. Is she imagining all of this? Can this be real? She stands at the back door, staring into space, wondering what she should do. In the house next door is their neighbor, Adelaide Churchill. She has just come home from shopping and she is unpacking her groceries in the kitchen and she sees Lizzie. And so through the kitchen window, she says, Oh, do come over. Someone has killed father. Mrs. Churchill then leaves to find help. And while doing so, she bumps into a news dealer on the street and he contacts the police. And so the police get the call at around 11.15 and at 11.25 minutes later, an office man shows up. And that is because the police were not operating at full capacity that day because they were attending their annual picnic. The info the police got was unclear. He did not know what he would find. And so the office man just didn't know what he would find. And so he just went over there to see what was going on. The news editors then got calls and they sent people down to the board and house. They thought it was a fight or a domestic disturbance. And so a swarm of people descend down upon the house and people are gathering rapidly and strangers go into the Borden house. And during all of this, Dr. Bowen returns home. And his wife tells him to head over to the Borden house and he is the first physician at the crime scene. Someone asks Lizzie where her stepmother was and she, in a daze, replies, Well, she got a note that a friend was sick and she went to see her friend. And so someone says that they should find Mrs. Borden and some of Lizzie's friends begin to arrive. And they begin to fan her and they're giving her a cold compress and they're just tending to her needs. And they all notice that Lizzie's hair and face and shoes and clothes are all in order as always. And so, yeah, she looks the same as always, except that she is clearly and utterly distraught. After all, her father has been murdered. This is the worst day of her life. Now, she's not sobbing. She's too rattled and stressed. Lizzie Borden is in complete and utter shock. She can't get the images out of her mind of what someone had done to her father. Mrs. Churchill and Bridget decide to go upstairs to see if they can get a sheet to cover Mr. Borden and to see if Mrs. Borden might be up there. They wondered if maybe she was attacked too. And so halfway up the flight of steps, 
Mrs. Churchill's eyes are level with the floor. That's the seventh step. And Mrs. Churchill can now see along the floor, under the bed, and on the other side of the bed, Mrs. Borden is lying there. Dead. Bridget then walks all the way up and she enters the room and she sees the body. Mrs. Churchill is terrified and so she turns and returns downstairs. The police begin to arrive and they take a quick look around, but they aren't searching for clues, they aren't really looking for anybody, and the doctor sees that Lizzie is in pretty bad shape and so he suggests that Lizzie and her friends go upstairs to her bedroom and that a telegram be sent to Lizzie's sister instructing her to come home. Can you imagine getting a telegram notifying you that your father had been murdered? How does one stay composed during that train journey home? Imagine what Emma Borden must have been going through at that time. A short while later, Lizzie and her friends are upstairs and the police enter the bedroom and they take a quick look around. Lizzie is also encouraged at that point to change her clothes for the first time that day. And she agrees to do so. The police walk to the barn to see if they can find any footprints or anything, but they notice that the barn is already filled with some neighbors who have been walking around inside the barn. At various points during the day, the doctors and police officers turn the dead bodies over and they move them around a bit. So when a photographer finally shows up to take photos of the crime scene, the bodies are no longer in the same position that they were in when Andrew and Abby Borden were murdered. So what do you think? Did Lizzie Borden kill her father and stepmother? Because if you do think that, well, the jury did not agree with you. You see, despite the circumstantial evidence against her, Lizzie was acquitted on June 20th of 1893, and she was set free. The public, of course, remained divided over Lizzie Borden's innocence or guilt, and a lot of people were suspicious. They thought, yeah, she probably did it. And people have been talking about it ever since that time. Because she was acquitted, because the jury did not find her to be guilty, the story that you just listened to is based on my idea of what likely happened since the jury did not think that Lizzie was the one who did it. So after listening to this story, what do you think about Lizzie Borden? Was she guilty or not guilty? Thank you.